Welcome to the next video in the Measure Theoretic Probability series. This is video nine, and we'll be discussing generated Sigmund algebras. So to give some motivation for what we're going to be talking about here, think about any sigma algebra that contains the intervals. I do want to give a word of warning. The sigma algebra that the, right, the smallest possible sigma algebra that contains the intervals is actually not going to end up being the collection of subsets of real numbers that we call the measurable subsets. We'll actually have even more than them. But we can, we, we certainly do want to measure, to, to have all the intervals, and we want to have a sigma algebra. So the smallest sigma algebra containing the intervals, we at least want to have them as measurable subsets of real numbers at the least. So for now, let's just think about that collection. Only much later on will we actually get around to talking about the even fuller collection of measurable subsets of real numbers. But for now, okay, we're going to focus our attention on the smallest sigma algebra that contains the intervals. Now, if you think about trying to characterize what sorts of things are in that collection, it can be fairly complicated because there's like this infinite iterative process to keep capturing more and more of those things. And here's what I mean. Well, we know it has to have the intervals, but if it's going to be a sigma algebra, it can't just have the intervals. It also has to be closed under unions and complements. So we take all of our intervals and we form every possible union and complement of any intervals. But now we've got new things in the collection and we risk that collection being again not closed under union and complement. If we could take the, the things that we just newly entered into the collection, we might be able to form unions and complements of those things in order to get new objects. And so we take unions and complements of the things that we just entered, and we enter those into the collection. But, but because we've just entered some new things, we have to take unions and complements of them again, and we have to do it again and again and again through this infinite iterative process. Now that's one way to characterize this least sigma algebra that contains the intervals, but it would be nice if we could have a somewhat more useful and simpler characterization of this smallest sigma algebra containing the intervals. And a very useful way to do it is to actually use the idea of minimality to almost do all of the work. So when we say minimal, well, you know, all we have to do, right, to, to sort of like cash in on this, this idea is we have to just get really rigorous and formal about what we mean by minimality. And then if we can say what we mean by minimality and define the minimal sigma algebra containing the intervals, or right here, you can see that I'm writing sigma angle bracket calligraphic B close angle bracket. That's the notation for the least sigma algebra containing a basis B. Here I've been talking about where that basis is the intervals. But in the more general case, we could take the basis to be anything we want. So that's notation for the minimal sigma algebra containing B. We also call it the sigma algebra generated by B. And we call B the basis. So if we can, so if we can characterize this idea of minimality in general, then we can generally define this object that we want in relatively simple terms. So to do so, right, we're talking about the minimal element. So in order to help us to talk about the minimal element, well, let's cobble together all of the objects, put them all together into a set, and then try to, you know, come up with the idea of which one in the collection is the least. So that's what we do here. We're going to have B be some subset of the power set of omega. Notice emphatically that B may not be a sigma algebra. This is only really, very, this is primarily interesting when it's not a sigma algebra. Now, 
define this calligraphic U to be the collection of all of the sigma algebras that contain B as a subset. So this is basically forming the universe of all the things that we want to consider, and we're trying to find the minimum in this universe. We want the least sigma algebra that is like this. And so that's how we define the sigma algebra generated by the basis B, as it is, right? In, although, right, we have to say what this minimality condition is. So we say that something is minimal in U if it is in U and also for anything else, right? So, so suppose that S is in U and for every T in U, we have that S is a subset of T. That makes S minimal. That's what we mean by minimal. So whatever is the minimal element of U, that is what we call the sigma algebra generated by the basis B. Now, having so defined it, we don't necessarily know that U has a minimum. So in the next page, we'll state and prove a theorem that will clear this and other things up. So what we're going to do is we're going to prove that the minimal sigma algebra containing B is the intersection over that collection U defined earlier. That's going to do basically a couple things for us, right? For one thing, it's going to establish existence. We will have something that satisfies those properties of being the minimal sigma algebra containing B as a subset. Also, we'll demonstrate uniqueness so that we really are justified in writing this as an equation indicating that there is this one thing that the sigma algebra generated by B is. Anyway, okay, so let's get into it. You can see the claim, right? Take U to B as in the previous slide. And we're going to claim that sigma of B, right, the sigma algebra generated by B, is this intersection. To prove this, we have to prove that that intersection has the properties that the minimal sigma algebra generated by B is defined to have. So what that means is we have to show that it's a sigma algebra and that it contains B as a subset. That's the part where we show that it is in U, basically, right? That was the, one of the requirements. And then the third thing that we show is the minimality part. Anyway, I'm going to skip proving number one because I'm actually going to prove a theorem in the next video that makes number one a trivial consequence because I'm going to prove that if you take any collection of sigma algebras, the intersection over them is a sigma algebra. And right, so since here U is a collection of sigma algebras, then that, right, that make the, the theorem that we prove in the next video will make this immediate. Okay, for the second part, we're going to prove that B is a subset of this sigma algebra, which is to say the intersection. Now, notice that by definition of U, right, what did we define U to be? U is the collection of all sigma algebras that contain B as a subset. So if you take any S in U, B is a subset of that S. But then it's an immediate consequence of that by the definition of the intersection over any collection that B is a subset of that intersection, right? Because it's effectively, right, the rough, slightly rough version. I mean, the, the fully formal and rigorous version of this is only one step different. But this, this is roughly just due to the fact that B is quote unquote, in every one of these S's, right? In, in the sense of a subset. And that's pretty much what it means to be in the intersection. If anybody, if anybody wants me to express that in the slightly more technical way, you can request it in the comments. And if I'm not too busy, I may fill in the slightly more rigorous version of that argument. But if we take that as done, then we're moving on to part three, where we show that this thing satisfies the minimality condition. So what that means is that we need to be able to take any element out of U, I'm going to call it S. We need to show that the intersect, that I'm re-indexing the intersection using T instead of S because I just don't want there to be a name collision, so to speak, between this S that we are fixing in U and 
the index that we're taking for the intersection. So that's the only reason T is occurring here is just to avoid name collision, but it's right. It's just substituting one name for another name. The intersection is still the same intersection that we've been talking about. But so what we need to do is we need to show that the intersection is a subset of S for every choice of S and U. That is the minimality condition. But in fact, this follows just because S is one of the sets being intersected. S is one of the T's in U, so to speak, right? And so whenever you take an intersection, then any set that occurs in the intersection is all, right, always contains the intersection as a subset. To take a simpler version of this principle, think about how when you take A intersect B, that's a subset of A. That's basically what's going on here. Now, having done that, we have basically just demonstrated that this object, the intersection, is one thing, one object, that satisfies the condition for being the sigma algebra generated by B. But we would like to know uniqueness as well. So not just existence, but uniqueness. That is to say, we would like to know that there are not some two elements that satisfy this condition. Well, this is actually handled very, very easily as well, if you approach it the right way. And that's because this satisfies a minimality condition. Any object satisfying a fairly reasonable minimality condition will always be unique. In this particular case, we can see it because, okay, what does the minimality condition mean? It means that our object is a subset of every other element in the collection. So, so if we had some second object, call it T, if we have some second object T that also satisfies these properties, they would both be minimal. And then we would have that one is a subset of the other and vice versa. That, that's a, just what the minimality condition expresses. And since they both have it, they are both subsets of each other. And that just proves equality.